um, you know, doing teardowns and rebuilds and all that kind of stuff. And to be honest, um, I, I don't work very well in front of the camera. I can't really, you know, if I'm, you know, troubleshooting a problem, I, I, I can't really think and talk at the same time. <laughs> I can barely walk and chew gum, walk, breathe, you know, just anyway. Um, so yeah, so we've been crazy busy the past, uh, four to six weeks. We've had a lot of tech work, a lot of, uh, new builds, um, there's, uh, we had the Philly NXL this weekend. Uh, there were some events tossed in there and obviously, you know, you have, uh, commitments outside of paintball and work that, uh, you know, it's getting to be that time of year. So, um, anyway, so I did, uh, I've been noticing a lot of guys have been posting up about, uh, having a, you know, your trigger sticking back, you know, you're shooting and then the trigger just like kind of hangs back or doesn't return real fast. And I thought that would be a good topic uh, that we could kind of cover um, in this video. And uh, I think uh, I have, well, I have two things here that we need to, uh, well, two different guns here that are, that we can kind of look at and we can kind of say, hey, you know, here's, here's some of the common things and I can actually show you. It's one thing to be able to you know, just kind of make a comment and be like, oh yeah, this is what it is. It's, I think it's going to come across a lot better if we actually show you. Um, so, uh, I guess let's begin at the beginning here. So, uh, I have a couple of guns here. Uh, the first one is, uh, an Inception Hornet. This is actually one of, uh, the first, this is actually one of the first guns that we sold as NFG. This was built for, uh, Paco, um, who's, uh, you know, a Valken. He's a, he's a big deal with, with Valken. He's a sponsored player and this guy plays his heart out. He's one of our sponsored players. Um, great guy. Um, but this guy is, is hard on guns. <laughs> he keeps us busy. Uh, I actually got a stack of five of his guns that need tech work and it's, uh, there's things in just various different stages of brokenness that we need to address. Um, but one of the things is, uh, so this guy has a velocity issue, which I think I have already figured out. Um, but I just need to, it shoots too hot. So that's a, an easy fix. Uh, I'm either going to adjust the pressure or I'm just going to respring the valve or maybe a lighter hammer spring. So that shouldn't be a big deal to, to get solved. Um, but the other thing is this guy here has an issue with the trigger pull sticking back. And this is something he didn't really mention, uh, but I figured it out when I was testing it the other day. And uh, this is a perfect example. This is like one of the number one causes of a trigger sticking back is the alignment of the front block. So... This can happen on any, you know, on any type of autococker. However, with the Hornets and Fleas and that kind of thing, if when these are getting built, um, it's, if whoever's building them isn't, you know, isn't like, you know, 100% paying attention, um, you know, so if you're building your own gun or maybe, uh, you know, your local shop built one for you or something like that, um, it's real easy for these for what, you know, when they're tightening down the, the banjo bolt, or in this case, the volumizer, uh, I'm going to tilt this down just a little bit so you can see the gun better. But, uh, so when they're tightening down the front block or the volumizer, it's not uncommon to see this front block get turned slightly either way. And what that does is that makes, that messes up the straight line here at your three way. Um, so if you kind of, it's, it's really kind of hard to tell, but um, it's very slight, but this three-way isn't perfectly parallel with the line of the body or the, the timing rod is not perfectly parallel with the, with the line of the body. That's the first thing I look at every time is, oh, my trigger sticking. Okay. I look and I check and see, you know, does this timing rod follow the path of the body? And the second thing I check is, is this aligned? Does this line up with the frame and is it straight? Um, hmm, I just got a ring alert. There's a structure fire a couple miles away from my house. I don't know if you guys have those ring doorbells, but, uh, 
they're pretty awesome. It's kind of nice that they, uh, you know, you get like alerts about, um, you know, other stuff going on in the neighborhood, right? You know, so you can uh, kind of keep yourself, uh, keep yourself aware of what's going on with, uh, you know, in, in your surroundings. So, uh, yeah, so when you, uh, when you send your gun to NFG, we keep everything, uh, we have full security, the alarm system, everything, um, and a really, really fierce attack dog, um, he'll, uh, he'll probably end up, uh, tripping over him if you tried to break into, you know, into the NFG headquarters, um, and, uh, probably twist an ankle or something terrible, and then he'd probably, you know, lick at you or lay on your head or something. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so the other thing that you want to do here is you want to make sure that the, that this, that, you know, the regulator is in line with the frame. Now this can happen on, uh, you know, non-inception cockers as well. Um, I actually fixed one. Actually, let's take a look at it. We have this, uh, this thing is so gorgeous. This is a, um, just like a, it's a matte black Evo and, I I love these guns. They have such cool lines on them, and they're just so smooth. Just really, really nice guns. But uh, this guy here had the same problem. His front block was tweaked really far to the side. Now, there were some other things going on with this gun that was causing the trigger stick, but this is a completely different system here, right? You know, we got a, a hinge trigger. Um, we have uh, the front block is not attached to the reg, so there's... Um, you know, it's a bit different of a dynamic, but it's still the same problem. And the problem that you're going to look for is, is this straight? Does this match up with the bottom line of the body and the top of the frame? It should be parallel. It should be the same distance from that line as it is to the timing rod across. And if you have one and you can't quite figure it out and you've, you've messed with this stuff, take a quick measurement. It doesn't take much. You can use... Um, I'd recommend getting your, you guys getting a pair of these. Um, this is just a, a quick pair of, of digital calipers. Um, I have a really nice set and then I have this set that's, you know, I keep in my toolbox and goes to events and everything. And you can use this to take measurements. And in a lot of cases, it does not take much to throw, to throw that off enough to make the trigger stick or the three-way wheat leak or any number of things. So you can take a quick measurement at the front, you know, at the front of the timing rod and a quick measurement at the back. And if there's, you know, a, a discrepancy there, you need to try and get that lined up a little bit better, okay? That's an easy way to tell, um, especially if it's something that you've been battling with. So and this gun is just, this gun shoots, oh my God, it's so nice. Um, I just wanna, I wanna tweak the timing up a little bit better and clean it up. Um, I have to, uh, I think I might want to give this guy a little bath in the Sonic Cleaner. He's got a lot of goop in this thing. It looks like he was playing and was having problems and just chucked it in a box and sent it. So we're going to send it back and make sure that it's gorgeous for him. All right, so back to this gun. So in this case, you know, our front block is skewed. Um, and it's real easy to tell on these because, um, you know, this, the reg, isn't straight up with the, isn't straight up with the frame. And I don't know if you can really see that, but from my perspective, it's like, it sticks out like a sore thumb. So what we're going to do is we're going to straighten that. And then when we tighten this back down, you want to make sure that you're holding so when you're tightening down the front block, I usually hold it like this. I hold the frame like this right around the right around the HPR. And then I just give just a little bit more love there. Just enough to give a little a little more tension. So uh because the one thing about the inception front block is it's great. I mean it's it's handy, it's easy to it's easy to put on, easy to take off, it does what it needs to do. Um, but if you don't have the if you don't have your banjo bolt tightened enough it's real easy to kind of to to skew that front block you know because you have all that extra leverage now the nice thing if you like to build guns and you're building minis or whatever it's real easy just to stick it on there but you know just you just have to know the dangers so um another big thing that that is the cause of trigger stick 
is your LPR pressure, okay? I can't tell you how many times I get guys they're complaining that you know their trigger's sticking or it's it has a slow action, and then I'm taking a look at it and you know their LPR is completely buried. Um, so when you set your LPR, um, typically, so like for my guns, what I do, I dial my LPR out every time I play. When I'm done, I wipe the gun down and make sure it's clean, and then I dial out the LPR. And I pull the trigger and make sure that there's no tension on the hammer spring, okay? Um, that way there's no, you know, you don't have any tension on any springs except your, your high pressure reg. Um, and that I don't mess with, you know. I mess with that when it's broken, you know. But usually I get them sweet spotted. I get my guns working the way I want them. And then I, you know, I leave it. I don't touch it. And then when those springs go, I'll invest the $1.50 or whatever to, you know, put the new springs in. Uh, but anyway, the LPR, uh, that's something I like to set every day because here's the, here's the thing, depending on, you know, is it, is it hot? Is it cold? Um, how's the paint that day? You know, you're going to want to have a different LPR setting anyway. So, um, you know, if you're using real brittle paint, you're going to want to have that LPR set a little bit lighter. So if you happen to pinch one, it doesn't make, you know, it doesn't get paint all up in your hopper and get your gun all gummed up. Um, if you're using a harder paint, maybe it's colder, you want to have a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit more pressure, or maybe you just like it, you know, like how it feels at, you know, wh whatever. Um, but then usually what I do is I just set this every day and it's real easy to do. You air the gun up, no paint, don't even put the hopper on, uh, put a barrel muffler on. Okay. I mean, you can do it with paint, but do it over at the chrono area or a shooting area where, you know, it's netted in and you're not going to like, you know, shoot somebody in the face. Um, safety first, always. I prefer a barrel muffler. You should have one of these in your toolbox. Um, I personally have an Eclipse muffler. I added some, uh, I actually got these at the plumbing store. It's just a, a uh, length, of, a three inch length of pipe and then a coupler um, that I could thread the, the, uh, the muffler onto and it works great and the best part it collapses and fits in my toolbox love it um but yeah so you want to use you want to use something like that um because it's it's going to create back pressure and it's going to give you a much better um you know instead of just dry firing you actually have back pressure the gun's going to behave a lot closer uh, to how it behaves when there's paint. It's not exact, but it's definitely better. And you're just setting the LPR, you know, you're not doing any super fine tuning or anything like that. So, um, but anyway, you air it up and you pull the trigger and you just turn that LPR in as you're pulling the trigger and you want to get it to where it cocks reliably. So every time you pull the trigger, you know, the gun cocks, the hammer locks back and the, the, uh, you know, the bolt moves all the way or the back block moves all the way forward and then you give it just an extra little, just an extra little bit, you know, maybe an eighth to, an, to a quarter of a turn, not much more, okay? And that's how to set your LPR pressure. Now, in a lot of cases, when we get the guns in and guys are complaining that, you know, the, the, there's a trigger issue or something like that, a lot of the times it's their LPR pressure or it's a combination of the LPR pressure and, um, you know, and that, that front block being kind of tweaked one way or the other. So, um, yeah, so before, you know, before you, you know, lose your mind because your trigger's sticking, those are the things that you want to look at. Um, now we're going to get into some of the, the more, some of the crazier things that can happen when you, uh, you know, with it, with, um, a trigger sticking back. So, uh, we are going to tilt it down and we're going to look at the gun. Da, 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 da. Actually, let me uh, make an adjustment here so we can get a little bit. There we go. That's a bit better. All right. So some of the other things that can go wrong with these, well, not go wrong, but be set incorrectly is if your trigger is sticking back, if these, so there's two nylon set screws that go, that, and these are in, uh, the, the V1 and the V2 version of the UFC, and there's two nylon screws. And if one of them is, is, is against the screw and the other one is not tightened against the screw or isn't there, 
for some reason, it pulls, like when you pull the trigger, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't pull quite straight or, I don't know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but um, a lot of times these screws can be the culprit. So um, make sure that these are in, and I usually try to get them to where they're uh, almost flush with, um, you know, with this piece of the of the valve uh, of the valve stem or not valve stem of oh, the three way shaft, um, so they're not really sticking out. So this guy here, we're gonna take this frame off and we're going to we're going to fix that and make sure that those are in correctly. It's assuming I can find the right Allen key, no, that's definitely not it. My workbench is a mess right now. I really got to. Uh, I have to invest. I need to take a night and just clean and organize everything again. It's just been a, a nightmare. I know I have the right one and this screw's a little bitched up. All right, well, let's go to the front one. You know, one of the things I found uh, pretty interesting is that this being like one of the first NFG cockers that we built, um, just all the little things that have changed since, uh, you know, since we first started doing this a couple of years ago, uh, you know, as NFG and doing the custom, you know, the custom autocockers, which now everybody seems to have a custom autococker, which, uh, you know, yeah, that's good. You know, nice to see, uh, things, things are growing. God damn it. Oh man, I hope this screw isn't straight. Maybe we can clean this out a little bit. Where, oh, where did my O-ring picks go? There we go. I have this big L-shaped one, and this thing's, like, pretty hefty. Oh, look, there's one. There's one. Look at all that dirt. There's, <laughs> like, there's literally a mountain of dirt inside of this screw, so that's why we can't get in there with the, uh, So we'll clear that out. There we go. Now hopefully our thing will fit in here. Look at that. Amazing what happens when we get rid of the dirt, right? And since we're taking this frame off, we can look at a couple of things within the frame uh, that might be that might be the the culprit of our uh, of our trigger issue. This gun is so dirty. I love Paco, man, but oh boy, he does a number on his guns. So, um, so we have the frame off, and some of the other things that we want to check is um, you want to pull the you want to pull the three way. Uh, make sure the shaft is straight. Make sure the timing rod is straight. What I do for that is, um, you know, I just I hold it and I just spin it make sure that it's that it that when I turn it it turns true uh, that looks pretty good and you know there's no grime or grit or anything inside of the three-way there uh, looks pretty clean miraculously um, so what we're gonna do is we're going to lube this guy up again Stick that back in there. And, oh, actually, you know what? Hang on, we're missing a step here. So the other thing we're going to want to do here is I want to run in these, these screws a little bit. So if you look, they're sticking out just a hair. So I want to run them in so we get a little bit better purchase on that timing rod. And honestly, this is probably, uh, this is probably a rookie mistake. This is something that we probably should have done at uh, when we built it. But actually kind of a, a neat history about this gun. So uh, this this gun we you know we built for, for for Paco. This is one of this is one of the first hornets. This is the so there was four mini hornets that were made from the factory originally. Uh, there's been a few others since then. Uh, but there was only four that were originally made 
uh, and intended as minis from the factory. And Simon made them for us at NFG. Um, and Paco bought two of these guns to use as... Um, they were basically his, his wedding presents to himself and his wife. And I actually have his wife's gun here, but that's already boxed up and repaired. And, uh, well, actually that didn't even need a repair. It just needed a, a, a HPR adjustment. Um, but they use these guns for their wedding. And on, on his wife's gun, uh, they actually, he got a, uh, a set of grips made up that have their wedding vows on them. And I thought that was just really, really kind of cool. Um, so it's pretty, pretty neat, you know, the kind of significance that paintball holds for people, um, you know, in the ways that they, you know, kind of incorporate it in their life. I thought that was interesting. So we want to make sure that this rod is not bent. We want to make sure the three-way rod is not bent. Check those O-rings. Make sure that there's no gouges or twists. If, you know, if you have an O-ring that's twisted there, that can cause drag and that can cause trigger stick. So, um... Now, uh, so let's talk about the frame. So the frame is where a lot of guys think that trigger stick happens, and it can happen there. Um, you know, essentially you have plate, you know, that moves back and forth within the frame, and then you have a, a sear that, that rolls up and down against the plate. You have a lot of opportunity uh, for places to have, you know, sufficient drag, um, to cause a trigger to stick, because that's all it takes, is just a little bit of friction. Um, you know, a little bit of dirt can get in there, a little bit of paint, and uh, we're gonna take a look at this and just make sure that it's all hunky-dory. Oh, Jesus. Must have put that one on with the, uh, with the, uh, the impact wrench, holy shit. Um, these grips are really nice. They're uh, aluminum, really cool. So anyway, so uh, the assembly for these is we have three shoulder screws. The main one that we're gonna take a look at is gonna be this top one. And this is the one for the, um, this is the shoulder screw that holds the, um, uh, the sear in place, sorry. It's been kind of a long weekend. I didn't, I haven't been able to, I haven't been sleeping very well. So, uh, anyway, so we're going to take that shoulder screw out and look at that. Here, let's see if I can focus that for you. So if you look at that, there's just a ton of dried paint and goop and dirt on that roller sear. So... That means that the inside of this thing is probably uh, pretty gooped up. So let's uh, let us move on and let's see what else we got going on in here. So we're going to remove our uh, the trigger pants or the trigger shoes. I like the term trigger pants. It sounds so. Sounds just more, much more fun. And take out this shoulder screw. There we go. And we'll take out this shoulder screw. And then let's take out the plate. We'll take a look at the plate. Yeah, look at the plate. It's just so filthy dirty. So we're gonna clean it. And then uh, that should clear up the issues with that. Uh, I, so remarkably, the inside of the frame looks pretty clean. Um, there, all the goop seems to be up at the top here. Looks like he took a shot in the trigger. Actually, if you guys hold on one second, I'm going to go grab some uh, some Q-tips. I will be right back. So sit tight. Keep the keep. 
talk amongst yourselves. Right, I am back. Got a big old fistful of Q-tips here. So, uh, in here we're gonna have, you know, we have our screw or our screw, our spring, and just for brevity, we're gonna take those out, and we're gonna get in here and we're gonna clean this out. And this is pretty dirty. It definitely, uh, definitely has some old paint in here. Yeah, look at that. Looks, looks like I cleaned my ears here, right? So we're going to get all that goop out of there. Alright. That looks pretty good now inside. There you go. Look at all that scum. I'm just trying to catch up on the uh, on the conversation here while I'm cleaning off the uh, trigger plate. So the trigger plate actually uh, was pretty disgusting. Arguably, I could uh, I could just uh, throw it in the Sonic Cleaner, but I don't have it set up right now. I'm actually not even sure what I did with it. I think it's in the trailer, to be perfectly honest. Because that's going to be one that's... Uh, we're getting ready to head to Ion here in a couple of weeks, so... Um, we want to be ready for anything up there at ION. So I've been starting to load uh, tools and equipment into the trailer and the RV so that uh, when you guys get up there, we can be like, yep, we got you covered. We got our sonic cleaner. We got this. We got that. And, you know, we can do whatever we need to do right there at the event and fix as many guns for you guys as possible. Oh, the outside of this frame is filthy. Jeez. All right. So let's go ahead and put this back together. We're going to put our sear spring in there. Um, one other thing you want to keep an eye out for is this little uh, half moon shaped bumper for your trigger spring. Uh, on the Inception and Empire triggers, you really should have these things in. Or actually, you need to have them in. Um, it does a couple of things. It provides a little bit of extra trigger tension so the trigger doesn't bounce around. Um, and it also holds that trigger in place. If it's not there, your spring can just pop out and then your, your gun will just stop working. And nobody nobody has that kind of time, nobody has time for that kind of negativity in their life. So we're gonna put that back in there. And we're gonna do our trigger plate. Pull that back. And I'm using that to pull the, pull the trigger spring back, right? And put our shoulder screw in there. Run that guy in. And let's do a, ooh. Let's do another. So I'm putting in the two trigger 
the two for the plate. And another thing to think about with these, if you're getting trigger stick, you don't need to wrench on these things. I see, a, like, I get a lot of guns in, and these things, like, guys, like, just wrench these, these screws in, and they don't need to be wrenched in. There's this, they put this, uh, this thread locker on from the factory, and this stuff is durable, and it works. Um... But there are some guys who are just, I don't know if they're paranoid or, you know, maybe, maybe they're just not, you know, maybe their parents didn't love them. I don't know. But man, they just wrench down on the screws and make them so tight. And you can actually make it so tight where you can pull this frame in, especially like right here, right? You know, this, this one right here, you can actually pull that in enough to where it'll make the trigger stick. <clears throat> And I mean, ultimately it can, you know, st you know, strip the hole and cause other issues and just don't do it. You just, you know, use your Allen key like this when you're tightening it goes, you know, in like this, this is all the tension you need. You don't need to use it, you know, this way, this is for breaking, you know, breaking the seal on the, on the nuts, not tightening or on the screws, not tightening. So let's go ahead, we're gonna put our trigger pants back on, trigger shoe, whatever you wanna call them. Whatever the in, whatever the, whatever all you kids are calling them nowadays. And then we'll tighten them down. Yeah, this was, this had a really, really gritty pull too, so. That was that. Oh wow, that's much better. Still got a little goop in there. Let's uh, get that in there. Wow, that's like night and day. So we'll put that in there. Let me get the right Allen key for the screw. Same thing with these with these uh, grip with grip screws. Um, guys like to wrench down on these things, and these grip screws tend to strip out pretty easily if you're not careful. So again, you know, just a little bit. And if you're paranoid, you don't want to, you know, your grip screws falling out. Just put a little bit of a thread locker on there if you're paranoid about it. A little bit of VC three will do the trick. Um, so anyway, to kind of review here, uh, the things that you want to check are going to be your frame. Make sure that there's not dirt in there or anything kind of gumming it up. You want to check the uh, the timing rod. You want to make sure that the, the shaft is straight, the timing rod straight. Make sure that, this, that the three-way is lubed. Make sure that the O-rings aren't twisted or otherwise, you know, in bad shape that could be causing drag. And then your front block needs to be straight, whether you have a one piece front block like the Inception has or an old style front block, both of them need to be straight. Um, and you do that by checking the alignment of the uh, timing rod with the line of the body or the top of the frame, whichever, basically that seam is what you wanna go against. That should always be straight. And the final thing is the LPR pressure. If it's cranked up, your gun is not going to, is not going to like it. You know, there's, now there are some LPRs that require, uh, three ways that require a higher pressure to set. So if you're using like a, uh, a bomb, uh, a lot of times you'll need to, you, you need to use a higher pressure to get the O-rings to seal because it's just, <coughs> it's just how it's designed. And the material that they use for the for those O-rings, there's you know, good, bad, or indifferent. It is what it is. Um, but uh, you can. But once you get those O-rings to set, you want to back it off a little bit to a reasonable pressure. You know, if that if that point where it where it sets is, is too high. I'm gonna tighten this back a little too much. So let's. Uh, Screwish guy in here. There we 
go. And you see, you see how I'm tightening them up? I'm not really wrenching on them. Finger tight with the Allen key this way. Pay attention, do it how the pros do, right? All right, so now we're going to uh, set our three-way adjustment. And uh, I'll tell you what, whoever, uh, who can tell me what the three-way adjustment is from the factory? Who knows that answer? Nobody. Okay. So the, th the three-way adjustment from the factory, like the stock boilerplate, you know, adjustment that you're going to, that you'll get. Um, and obviously it'll get tweaked a little bit because, you know, all the guns are shot from the factory. Uh, but it's one and a half turns is your initial adjustment for your three-way. So we'll set it to that. And then we start running paint through here. Um, we'll be able to uh, get this thing uh, working. Uh, as for the velocity thing, I'm going to have to deal with that tomorrow. Um because that's going to require tearing down all the guts and probably looking at that if if I can't if I can't make it shoot the way I want with the uh, with uh, raising or lowering the pressure. But you know what? Let's uh, let's go ahead and take a look. Let's just see what the pressure's at here. Since you know we're working on this gun and all. I'm going to help my pressure tester get off to. There it is. I need to, I really need to clean and organize my bench. It's almost embarrassing. I don't know if you guys watch Lighter Kenny, but it's fucking embarrassing. I think that's probably the best one liner from that show is that dude screaming. It's fucking embarrassing. Love it. And I'd love it even more if I could get this tank to, uh, to screw on. Alright, so let's see where our pressure's at. Pressure's a little high. So we're going to adjust that ever so slightly. There we go. So now we are at our factory baselines, and we can, uh, so we're at our factory baselines, and we can get this thing uh, sorted out velocity-wise tomorrow. I don't like to shoot this late at night, because then it gets the kids up, and that's a pain in the ass. Um because then they're up and then they don't want to go back to sleep and you know anyway so now we got another one this guy so this one here has a very interesting issue uh if you shoot it right-handed it shoots just fine and if you shoot it left-handed it makes the trigger stick so based on what we just talked about in the other video we're going to, or not the other video, but for the other gun, we're gonna take a look at a couple of things here. First things first, we wanna make sure that this, okay, right here, see it? Can, can you guys see that on the video? This front block is so loose, I can just, I can move it back and forth. So that is likely the cause of the trigger stick. So you're shooting it right-handed, you're holding it this way, and then when you change hands, you're putting different pressure on that three-way. And actually, you can, you can feel the drag. You can feel the drag shooting it this way because you're putting uh, different pressure. And th there's it takes nothing to move this front block. So this side, nice and fine, holding it like this. I can, you can totally feel the, the, uh, the drag on that trigger. So, 
All right, and this thing is also filthy. So we're gonna take this apart. What the? F Paco, what the fuck is this? God damn it. God damn it, Paco. What is that? <sighs> That's gonna be a $15 screw, just so you know. Ugh. Putting a pan head screw in there like that. Or not a pan head, um, this screw. What, he told me to check the screw? He's got to stop smashing this thing into trees. I think that's the problem. He's got to stop breaking the damn thing. And Justin's on enough of these videos. He should know better than put a screw like that in one of these frames. And then, and then let you send it to me like that. For the love of Christ. All right. So, Justin, your problem, I'm pretty certain, is this front block is just disgusting loose. It is so loose, and it's enough to where just changing hands is enough to move that front block. So that's most likely the problem that's causing it. But we're going to check everything. We're going to check all the things that we talked about uh, earlier on the gun. So first things first, we're going to check it. We're going to clean up this thing because I know it's uh, it's been a while. This thing has been... This was last in for service a little over a year ago. Um, yeah, oh, I know. It's totally him. Dude, he like... Honestly, he probably like broke the gun when he slammed it into the tree. So that's kind of what I think. And I mean, I don't know what you did to make him mad enough to like whack your gun into a tree like 10 times, but I don't know. You uh definitely have to you have to work that out. We can't we can't we can't have that kind of anger. It's not good for you. It gives you heart problems. All right. So anyway, anywho, so, yeah, this, uh, yeah, you guys were definitely in some mud. Holy shit balls. Okay. So another thing you got going on here is this, uh, uh, the top screw here in the frame this thing was like really loose and I don't think I don't think that's gonna cause your trigger stick but it's definitely not a not a it's not good that 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 that's loose because that's your sear that's your sear pivot point right so we're gonna pull this out a lot cleaner than the other one let's run a q-tip in here See what's what. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's got a little bit of a, just a little bit of the usual blackness in there, but there's no mud or paint or anything in there that we can tell. Yeah, it looks, by and large, it looks pretty clean in there. Um, the trigger is really nice and smooth. But you know what? Just for giggles, let's take this all the way down. Oh, this is the other problem. The trigger pants are on backwards. <laughs> you have anger issues sometimes. Well, have anger issues with your own damn guns, Justin. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I remember one time I was playing a tournament. I got ejected for chucking, a, for chucking my gun. That was pretty awesome. I was so pissed. Fucking thing. That cocker that I had that year was... That thing was abysmal. And then... After a while, I got it really... I got it really, really humming along nice. And that was actually ended up being one of my favorite guns. 
and then fast forward to just before the Cocker craze, I, I uh, sold it to a guy who claimed to be a collector, uh, and he ended up being one of those fucking guys that parts guns out, and uh, yeah, all these screws are loose, so that's going to be a, uh, that's going to, that can cause the issues, this, this can cause trigger sticking issues, because stuff is, it has play in it then, right, so it's not going to, um, you know, it's not necessarily going to, going to work the way that it should, because the triggers aren't, or the, uh, the pieces aren't, uh, the screws aren't tight, so the pieces aren't being held in place, so we have all of our trigger parts there, that's a big plus, you know, we're not missing the bumper, we're, the, we're not missing the spring, and for brevity, we're going to clean this out, because there is, there is some shit in there that's going to, uh, you know, and if it, if it was the Philly NXL field, it definitely would be shit, so, <laughs> the mud at Philly just stank so bad, it was, uh, I'm pretty certain that it used to be farmland, and, um, you know, being farmland, it's, uh, definitely has manure mixed in there and you can smell it. I mean, it's, you can, you can smell it in the dirt. It's definitely, it's definitely there. So, uh, but aside from that, I mean, the, uh, the Philly event was pretty neat. I've, I've actually never been to an NXL, uh, event before it, um, was uh kind of it was different it was eye opening um and it was neat to neat to see you know neat to kind of uh catch up with people in a bit different setting than what I'm used to um <coughs> you know but uh that was like the first you know quote unquote speedball tournament I've attended in ages um I think the last one might have been a PSP event so but this was my first uh actual for real NXL event which is pretty sad considering how long the NXL has been around This plate is uh, abnormal. This isn't a normal uh, inception plate that I'm used to seeing. So I might have to... Uh, I'm going to take a picture of that. And I'm going to ask Simon. This might just be one of the super early plates. But, you know, my memory is pretty shitty right now because I'm so fucking tired. So we're going to take a picture of that. And I'm going to... If I don't remember by morning, I'm going to, I'll ask Simon about what the hell it is. If I can find the camera app on here. There it is. There we go. All right. So now let's, uh, let's move on here. Um, oh, Justin, I did get your timing rod yesterday. Uh, so hopefully I'll have that done tomorrow, tomorrow or the next day I'll have your gun done and you should be good to go. I would be finishing it up tonight, but Paco needs these guns to ship tomorrow. So it's all his fault that, uh, you know, it's not going to ship tomorrow. All right, so let's go ahead and let's do the right thing here, and let's put some red Loctite on these screws. Just kidding. It's the blue stuff, but it looks like the red. So we're gonna put a little bit of that on these on these uh, shoulder on these shoulder screws, uh, just to make sure that they're gonna stay in place and not get loose. And you don't need a ton. 
You don't need a shitload of it on here. You just need enough just to keep them from wiggling out. Uh, it, but it's one of those areas that you get a lot of, you know, there's a lot of vibration. There's a lot of everything going on in the frame. It's your contact point with the, you know, between you and the gun. So it's going to, it's going to take a beating. So you want to make sure that you have your screws in there and they are ooh, uh, secure, not super tight, but secure. And again, look and see, watch how I'm tightening these. You know, we're not, we're not wrenching down. I guess it would help if I, I guess it would probably work better if I put the, uh, the sear in, uh, before I put the screw in that holds the sear. That might make things a little bit easier. Might work a little better. Let's go ahead. We're going to tighten that up. And fun thing about Loctite, it only, uh, cures correctly in uh without in the absence of air so you need to make sure that your screws are at least finger tight to be able to get to push the air out from in between the threads so that it can cure otherwise it'll just it'll turn into like this sludge and it'll actually collect dirt um and just turn into a uh just turns into a mess so you want to make sure that uh you know Make sure your threads are tight enough if you are using Loctite. Uh, if you have a, a situation where you have a thread where you don't need it that tight, like a cocking rod, right? So like a cocking rod, you want to have those things finger tight, and sometimes they're gonna they're gonna you know come out. So if you have a um, if you have a hammer that doesn't have a uh, a locking screw for your cocking rod, you want to put a little VC three on that bitch, right? So a little bit of VC3 is going to hold that guy in place and make sure this is the stuff right here. You need to have this in your toolbox. It doesn't matter what gun you shoot. It doesn't matter if you work on your guns. If you don't work on your guns, you should have this stuff. You should have a tube for your toolbox and a, tu and a tube for your house. I put this shit on everything. Uh, when I got my new grill, guess what? I put VC3 on the screws. Uh, when I take a screw off of the RV and put it back in, guess what? Boom, VC3. I put this shit on everything. It's great stuff. I make sandwiches with VC3. Peanut butter and VC3 on white bread is my favorite. So anyway, this is the shit you need to have. Um, and why this stuff is so great is because it doesn't set up to be it, it, it sets up, but it doesn't like set up uh, super hard like Loctite does. So um, you can use it two or three times, but because it doesn't set up as hard. So, you know, when you have something that's super hard, it the harder it is, the more brittle it, it ends up being, right? So as you apply vibration to something that is hard, you are going to get, you know, it's going to break down. Whereas this stuff is more, it gets to be like a really thick, thick, thick uh, jelly, like snot, right? It's like a, it's like thread locking snot. And, you know, it, it gets hard to a point and it, it'll hold your screws. But because it doesn't get, you know, super brittle, it, you know, it absorbs the vibration and keeps your screws in place. So this is great stuff. Um, you can use this on cocking rods. Uh, we use it uh, particularly on um, uh, the uh, the valve retaining screw. We use it on cocking rods that don't have inception hammers in them. Um, we use it on um, I don't I generally don't use it on frame screws or anything like that, um, but I'll use it on. Um, uh, oh, the beaver tails, beaver tails and uh, pump arms. I use it, you know, on the backs of pump arms to hold the back blocks or um, or the sleds. So, yeah, it's that is good stuff to have. And you should always have it in your in your toolbox because it will just save you so much headache. And it's and the nice thing about it is you don't need heat. So. Once you have that thing in there, or once you have that VC3 on there, you can still take the screw off. You don't need to. You don't need to 
apply heat to it. You don't need to mess with it. You just go ahead and um, uh, you just, you know, unscrew it with Allen keys. You don't need anything special to take it off, but it will hold and it will hold really, 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 really well. All right, so let's uh, gingerly tighten that. And then uh, we're gonna put this $17 screw to replace that pan head screw that I took out. We're gonna put that $17 screw in the front. So, or not pan head, the V head screw. Uh, I'm gonna have nightmares about that. You know that? Nightmares. All right, that right there, seventeen dollars screw. Okay, Paco, you can you can roll that cost right over to 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 uh, to Justin. I'm pretty sure it's his uh, it's his fault since he probably broke that screw off smashing it against a tree. So. He, yeah, you're never going to hear the end of that, by the way. So uh, now we're going to address this front block issue. And the thing that comes to my mind is that if it's this dirty and if it's uh, this loose, did any dirt or gunk get in there? I'm going to say, based on the three-way and what the three-way looks like, I think we're probably in good shape. Um and given that we do have a tight turnaround for these for these guns, I don't want to go ripping it apart, but we are going to try and tighten up this three-way. Or not the three-way, the front block. So let's get our tool in here. And ordinarily for these, I like to use T-handles, but because we are gonna need to get some leverage on here, I'm amazed that it wasn't leaking out the out the. Uh, I'm amazed it wasn't leaking out the, um, you know, right here where the body meets. Just how loose that was. So now that's lined up pretty well. And then more importantly, when I look at this line here, I'm comparing this with the with the bottom of the body. I can see that's nice and straight. So that uh, seems to be in good shape. And it's definitely a lot better because when we first started working on this, if I put this, you know, in my left hand to shoot and I held the this and I held the reg, you could immediately feel the drag in, in the, in the three-way and I'm getting nothing. So that's a plus. Um... And then here, here's another, here's another one right here. See the LPR? This thing is buried. So I don't, I don't remember how the uh, LPR is really, um, like how sensitive they are. Oh God, this thing is fucking gross. Um, so I forget like exactly how many turns kind of yields how much pressure for the Empire ones. But uh, yeah, this thing is filthy. Uh, but you don't, re you really don't want to bury the LPR and leave it buried. You want to make sure that you're setting it each and every time. Let's get that crud out of there. Look at that. That is nasty. And the other reason that you want to get the crud out of here is that, um, you know, if you start, if your springs start to get corroded, it can eventually begin to start affecting performance. So corrosion can weaken the metal and it can have a negative effect on your springs. Now, a big burly spring like this, probably not so much, but um, the, you know, springs that are, have a little bit finer, um, uh, a little bit finer of a uh, uh, 
thickness can be. Oh, here's a pro tip for you, by the way. You can remove the uh, LPR internals with a caulking rod. And it looks like you have like an entire paintball in here. So we'll just clean that up for you. Hey, no problem. Just, uh, I just don't understand how it got so dirty in the dead box, man. Paco said you were just like in the dead box the entire time, so I don't know. All right, so we're going to lube that guy up. And this is one of the things that guys love to do. They love to put tons of lube on their shit. And you can actually have too much lube. And uh, it can actually cause problems. I actually, I got, a, uh, I got a gun last year at Ion. And there was literally so much, he put so much lube on the ram that the front, it had like a quarter inch of lube just in the front. And there was so much there the RAM couldn't function. So over lubing is, is real. You know, the, the threat is real. And let's go ahead. We're going to put our spring back in there. Everything on the other side of that, of the LPR plunger there was, was pretty clean. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to bother digging in any further. Um, but then, you know, you can start to feel right when that spring starts to get engaged there. And that's when you want to stop turning. And unless if you're using this gun every weekend, you want to back, you know, you back this out. Don't leave this guy pressurized and set your LPR every, every time you go and play. That's my recommendation. That's what I do. And it's not really so much to, it's not a thing to like, you know, save money or anything like that. It's just, it's just the right thing to do. You have spring compression in there. And the reality is, is your LPR is something that you are going to want to make an adjustment to depending on, you know, the, the environment variables. So your, um, you know, the type of paint you're using and what the weather's like, you know, maybe it's, you know, it, it even, you know, playing in the, you know, in the rain and humidity can even, you know, that you might, you, you just want to have that block cycle a little bit differently, uh, to deal with whatever. Um, so set that LPR every time. And if you don't, and if you don't know how to do it, it's very easy to do. Basically you just turn that in as you pull the trigger. And, um, once the gun cocks reliably and, um, uh, basically once that gun cocks reliably, you give it an extra, you know, maybe an eighth, an eighth of a turn, just enough to kind of juice it up and make sure it's good and that's that nice and easy and then at the end of the day dial it out so that way you're not leaving pressure on those on those springs and I will confess that is just me being somewhat anal retentive but you know it's uh you know it's nice when you pull your guns out and they always work so all right so this thing feels like a billion times better now it was uh, pretty, pretty sloppy. And this is nice and straight. Looks good. Feels good. And then tomorrow, I'm going to gas this guy up and make sure it's good to go. And then hopefully I can get these guns on the way to EMR uh, on Tuesday at the absolute latest, most likely tomorrow, uh, if I can make the post office. So, all right. So I think we're in good shape. So now we just need to, uh, the next step to these is testing them out make sure that they're doing what they need to do. Uh, on Paco's gun, we need to check the, the, uh, velocity, make sure that the velocity is good to go. Uh, that was one of the things he was saying he was having issues with. Could could be could be a spring i mean it feels like it's all right but it could be a spring but we'll uh take a look at that this guy here it was just a trigger issue 
there's a lot of crud in there. And I'm actually kind of debating maybe uh, tossing this guy in the Sonic Cleaner tomorrow. Um, just to get rid of all this shit that's just everywhere on this gun. Because the reality is dirt, dirt impacts performance. You know, I said it. <laughs> you know, you have dirt on the outside of the gun. You have dirt on the inside of the gun. It's just, it's just how it is. And that's going to impact the performance. It's going to make stuff not work the way it's supposed to work. So, um, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness uh, when it comes to having stuff that you want to work reliably all the time. Um, but, you know, cockers are a little bit forgiving, so you can leave them a little bit dirty, and that's okay. But, um, you know, usually in a lot of cases, dirt, you know, dirt is what causes the problem. Dirt goes in and causes O-rings to fail. It, you know, it's grit, uh, you know, grit gets into a gun and, and etches the inside of pneumatics and causes them to fail. Um, you know, all different, uh, all different scenarios there. So was there anything else with this, Justin? Was velocity good on this? Um, anything just, it, was it just the, the trigger stick thing? I just want to know exactly what I need to check for since this is kind of a, a super rush job. Velocity would jump about 20. That's probably paint. Were you running a type bore barrel on it? And what paint were you shooting at ICPL? Was, was it Falcon? Yeah, that was paint. The, the, the paint that Falcon sent out to ICPL was less than stellar. I'm, and I'm a big Falcon fan. Love those guys. But the reality is they... Um, we kind of dropped the ball a little bit on the ICPL paint. Um, all right. We got here a couple timing rods. Picked up my inception order from Simon yesterday, so that's pretty cool. So this is going on Justin Silverman's gun. So since we're here, and, you know, there's a couple of us here, let's go ahead and we will uh, finish fucking up. I mean, building uh, Justin's gun here. Since it just needs that uh, that timing rod installed, and then uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish it up tonight, though. My belt sander's in the shop, so And, you know, we're actually at a pretty decent level of tech stuff. Maybe the last couple guns I have on the stack here, maybe uh, um, maybe we can go ahead and uh, we'll do videos for those this, you know, more this week. Maybe we'll do videos a couple nights this week. We'll see. Um, yeah, because we're getting to be that time of year. Yeah, I heard that he left it out, um, but I don't necessarily know that that hurt things. <laughs> I think the paint was fundamentally not spectacular, and then um, when he left it out, it actually kind of helped you guys out because uh, the paint was insanely small, so... And it's, uh, unfortunately for, you know, if you've got a team and you're running auto cockers, that ain't going to work. You know, if, if you're running, you know, an electro, you just kind of, uh, you just, uh, you know, if you're not underboring, you're just, or well, slightly underboring, you're just going to have a bad day. And if you're not, uh. You know, it's not like, it, you know, you're shooting an electro and you just kind of goose the pressure up a little bit and make it work. Um, yeah, a bit inconsistent is, is definitely going to be, that's definitely going to be your paint. I'm almost positive of that. I mean, I can tear into the HPR, but 
definitely, you know, underbore a little bit. And if you're still having issues, have Paco bring it to, uh, to Ion. And we'll, we'll deal with it there if it still has issues. I assume you, are you guys coming to Ion? I assume Paco will be because he's there like all the time. All right, timing rod is installed. Now, hopefully, this uh, fucking front block isn't doesn't leak because you know it's a Merlin, and those front blocks are just a fucking bitch. I should have done a video on how to put the front block on a Merlin because it's really, it's not fun. You have to like put the thing on there and then turn it on and you have to be like super careful with it because like the slightest little nick in that, in that O-ring just completely fucks the whole thing and then you have to start all over. Laughing all what do you mean people shooting the bouncy balls at each other? You mean the shitty skirmish paint? Last year the paint seemed pretty good. Last year, like, I didn't hear hardly any complaints about the paint. Usually, everybody's always bitching about the paint up there. I don't know, maybe... Maybe people just weren't complaining about it to us. But, uh... Or maybe, you know what? I'm thinking a super game. So we got a little leak here, uh, down here on this sidewinder. So let's see if we can uh, tighten that bitch up. Where are my tools? Okay. I gotta get my bench organized. This is just a nightmare. Let's see if it's just a tightening thing here. Hopefully it is. Yep. Just need to be tightened. curious here so wow like so the front block is ceiling i can't freaking believe it yeah paco was telling you guys we're gonna have a nice house for ion i'm just gonna i'm gonna take the rv up and uh simon and i will be uh um setting up our usual uh <laughs> Our usual compound in the back, so that'll be pretty sweet. Um, yeah, not sure if I'm gonna bring the pizza oven or what. I'm probably gonna bring the pizza oven and the smokers, so that way we can have a uh, really good food all weekend. Cause that's what we do. That's really the only reason we go to Ion is for the camping, cause it's you know free camping pretty much. So. Wow. Nice. All right. 
This actually feels uh feels pretty decent there, uh, Justin. I'm just going to uh, double check the pressures and make sure it's all good to go. But I think uh, I think you're gonna be in good shape. I can't fucking believe it. This thing was like so. Th so this gun actually came to me in a trade, um, but the guy had it in for tech work, and I could not get this front block for the life of me to seal. I tried like countless O-rings and I ended up ordering a special O-ring um, or special O-rings. It's like a fatter, um, a fatter number 13 than normal. And that thing didn't even, uh, didn't even seal. So what I ended up doing was I took that fatter O-ring and then I like soaked it in Dow 55. I soaked like five of them in Dow 55 and the first two didn't work. And then the third one that I soaked in Dow 55 uh, worked perfectly. It actually like swelled the O-ring enough and it, and it sealed up pretty good. So um, let's uh, make sure we're good. All right, it's like 300. So I'll have to, uh, I'm going to have to check velocity on this and everything tomorrow. So, but it's, uh, right at, it's like 310 and I don't, I can't recall what valve is in this thing. But once, uh, once we do that, then we'll have an idea of, uh, what we need to do velocity wise. I think... Yeah, I forget what valve is in here. I think this has an AKA valve in it, so that, that might be a little high. So we might have to back the pressure off a little bit. So yeah. Hey, no problem, man. Yeah, it was a uh, kind of dumb luck. You messaged me, you were like, you know, what do you? Where's my gun? I'm like I'm working on it. <laughs> I was literally sitting here working on your gun when you messaged me. I thought it was kind of funny. So, all right. So that's, uh, that's in pretty good shape right there. So we're a bit ahead of the game. Uh, I do have an SFL over there to work on. And then um, I have a couple of uh, Paco's guns, a couple other of Paco's guns that are going to be a little, take a little bit of time to get done. Um, so maybe we'll do videos on those later on. So anyway, so uh, I was at the uh, Philly NXL yesterday. Um, I took my son up, and uh, we were walking around, and you know it was kind of cool. It was part, you know, one of those things. It was, uh, uh, you know, part business, part uh, you know, fun going to an event, right? You know, it's like when you work in the industry, you're, you know, you're kind of you're going out and. You, the deal machine is always on. You're always like, you know, talking to people and, you know, trying to figure out what's what and what's coming and, you know, all that kind of good stuff. And, um, it was a, it was definitely a, a neat day. You know, I got to meet a lot of cool people. Uh, I made some new friends, you know, caught up with a lot of old friends. You know, it's nice. It's always nice. Uh, you know, Steve Cusano drove down from, uh, from New York, uh, and I was walking around with him most of the day. And I got to talk with, uh, with Buddy Barr and Frank Newman and Rob Schaefer and, uh, you know, Wilbur Galt and, uh, went in and I was talking with the, with the die guys for a little bit and I was talking with the HK guys for a little bit. So there's, there's just, you know, a lot of things, um, you know, just a lot of people to kind of get out there and talk to. So, um, you know, a lot of the, you know, lots of players and everything that, you know, Every, everybody's there, right? You know, it's a nationwide major event. So, you know, all the pros are there and, you know, the usual suspects, you know, the, uh, you know, Maddie and, you know, all the guys that do the GoPro stuff are there. So, and it, it it's kind of cool, you know, it's like you walk into the dive booth and it's like, Hey, there's Billy wing, you know, and it's kind of cool to see somebody. And, and Billy's one of the guys that I do really enjoy talking to. Uh, cause he's really smart. Like he does, he's actually, I think, uh, he's, he's one of the lead designers, if not the lead designer for Dai. Um, so a lot of the things that Dai puts out, you know, 
the DM series. I know like he's done a just scads of of improvements to the to the DMs now the you know the M two M three whatever series you know he's he's kind of the 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 brains behind that operation and he really does uh you know he's a smart guy he's cool to kind of talk to a little bit and really really a nice very very nice guy um so if you ever get the chance to talk to him make sure you uh swing in and you know say hi and say hey you know thanks for you know doing whatever it is you know you do uh for you know whatever (laughs) but you know he's a good guy so say hi um you know, it was kind of neat. You know, there was uh, a lot of the vendors there were, you know, it's the usual suspects. It was, uh, the vendors were HK, Eclipse, GI, um, Valken was there. Um, who else? Uh, I said die, obviously, because they were there. Um, HK Army was there. Uh, they had a pretty big tent. Virtue was there. They had a very big tent. Um but it was really kind of, uh, it was interesting. So, um, you know, I've been hitting the mech circuit pretty hard, uh, the past couple of years. We've been at every ICC. We did Atlanta. We, um, you know, we, we do a lot of scenario games. We've gone out to living legends. We've, we do super game East. We hit up cousins, uh, dark ops games. We don't vend there, but we are there. And, you know, we, we usually end up doing a little bit of tech work while we're there, but more so we're there to play and kind of hang out with people, uh, do some networking, that kind of thing. Um, and the one thing that, that really kind of struck me about that event was it was like, like it was so professional. I mean, it was like, everything was like, everything was nice you know, like they had nice signage up and it seemed like, you know, they had like the, they had the nice scoreboards and the, you know, everything just seemed like it was just really, really nice and professionally well done. Definitely a lot different from the days, uh, you know, when I used to, when I used to play tournaments, um, you know, I played in the MPPL and it was, I'll be honest, it was pretty half-assed, you know, for the most part, you know, he's, some fields you'd have netting and it would all be nice. Then you go to another field and it would be, you know, kind of a shithole. Um, so it's really kind of neat to see, you know, that there's this kind of really professional, uh, setup and, you know, things are, you know, you can tell they're really, you know, they're really trying to put their best foot forward. Um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, attract outside sponsors and TV and all that, you know, all that stuff that, um, you know, was important up until the past couple of years when we really kind of started realizing that TV was never the right answer for paintball. Um, but that's another discussion that, you know, that we don't need to have tonight because, hey, it's, it's already pretty late. Um, and the other thing that really kind of, uh, that really kind of struck me was it didn't seem like a lot of the players were really having fun. Um, I mean, like, so I, I, I watched a lot of the, uh, well, not a lot, but enough, like a couple hours worth of games while we were there. And it was mostly like the, the amateur guys. Like I really don't have much interest in seeing the pros play. Um, you know, I mean, cause like, you know, they're going to be good. You know, they're going to they're gonna have some blazing moves and do that. And I want to see how the everyday, you know, more like the everyday kind of players play so that I have a better idea how to meet the needs of those players as a business owner. I want to know the kind of gear that they need. I want to know, you know, what, you know, how they, how they use their guns. What kind of problems do they have with them? What kind of things do I need to keep on hand? And when I'm watching... Uh, you know, when I'm watching games at a mech event or even at the NXL, that's the kind of stuff that I'm kind of thinking in the back of my head, how, you know, what can I do to kind of make this guy's life a little bit better, right? Um, But the one thing that really kind of struck me was like there, it was not a, uh, it wasn't like a fun, you know, festive kind of atmosphere like, uh, like, like the other events that I've been to were. So the, um, you know, so like ICC, it's like, you know, everybody's there. There's, you know, when you're not on the field, people are walking around and talking. Everybody's got a smile on their face. They're happy. You know, scenario games, it's, I mean, it's, it's basically 
you know, glorified rec ball with a big story. Um, so I don't expect people should be like, you know, angry or, you know, not having fun. You know, you're paying a lot of money to go and have fun. So you should be having fun at a scenario game. But, um, it was just kind of crazy that there was, you know, in the pits that, uh, or not the pits, but like the staging areas there where the, uh, you know, where the, where the players got to, uh, um, you know, set up. Oh, excuse me. Mm, you know, uh, but yeah, so like that staging area, there just, there wasn't like a lot of like, you know, there wasn't a lot of smiles in there and a lot of dudes like just screaming and yelling at each other, ass chewings going left and right. It was just kind of crazy. Um, I don't know. It's just, I just remember it. I remember it being a lot more fun when I did that stuff than it looked like those people were having, but you know what? It was kind of hot yesterday. It was muddy. Maybe everybody was just in a shitty mood. I don't know. But that was just kind of my... Just some things that I observed. Um, I mean, aside from that, you know, I think it was a really, really cool event. Really neat experience. And, you know, it's my first NXL. I've never been to an NXL event before. Uh, I have been to a PSP event. And I imagine... You know, I kind of imagined it was going to be pretty similar to that. And, hey, guess what? I was right. You know, it was pretty similar to a PSP event as far as format and setup and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, it was just, uh, it was neat. It was definitely eye opening. I think, uh, you know, Tom Cole does a nice job with, with producing the event. Um, you know, but they got crushed with rain and, you know, I live, uh, maybe a half hour, uh, west of where the event was. And I mean, all the planning and the logistics in the world, <laughs> weren't going to make, you know, weren't going to help with the mud situation and all that. So, uh, you know, kudos to Tommy Cole and his team, uh, in, in the NXL for, you know, they had wood planking down and they were doing what they could to help with the mud. Um, you know, and unfortunately, you know, it wasn't great, but I mean, what are you going to do? You know, you can't, uh, you know, you're limited to what you can do because you're not, you know, they're, they're leasing that land or renting that land for the weekend. Um, and you know, it's not like they can come in and put stone down, you know, along the main, you know, the main drag where all the vendors are, uh, they can't, you know, the best they can kind of do is put, you know, wood planks down. With that being said, you know, they had wood planks down the whole way. Um, they could have used four wide. They were only two wide. So basically, you know, eight foot wide a walkway, but with the number of people there, it was kind of, it was, it was kind of sucky and you ended up walking in mud a lot, but you know, there's just not much, there's not much that he could have done. You know, there's not much that, 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 that the NXL could have done to really alleviate that. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely really cool. So, uh, you know, if you get a chance to go to one of these national events and you're not, uh, uh, you know, even if, if you're playing, if you're not playing and it's, you know, close enough, you know, where you can drive there, it's definitely worth going and checking out. You know, I mean, if it comes around again, I'll go for the day and spend a couple hours there like I did yesterday. And, um, yeah, so. All right, guys. Well, I am going to call it a night. I am tired. It is one in the morning and, um. Uh, I have some shit I need to get done tomorrow, apparently. I need to get Paco's guns finished up and boxed up and hopefully out by three for the post office. And I need to get Justin's gun tied up this week. I want to get that Evo out. And then I got two or three guns over there on the stack that we're going to cover in other videos this week. So... Anyway, uh, so this is Greg from NFG Customs. Um... I'm calling it a night. Have a great night, guys. Thanks for joining. It's always a pleasure talking. Bye.